Chapter 9 It was indeed a mystery. The pressmen thrust their way through the crowds of baffled onlookers and peered disbelievingly down from the bridge to the muddy track of twisted bicycle frames, old tin cans and discarded pram wheels which spread away into the distance. How an entire one-mile stretch of canal from the river lock to that of the windscreen wiper factory could simply have vanished overnight seemed beyond anybody's conjecture. It couldn't have gone out through the river lock, an old bargee explained. It's high water on the Thames and the river's six foot up the lock gates on that side. And at the other end, the bargee gave his inquisitor a look of contempt. What, travel up hill into the next lock, you mean? The interviewer coloured up and sought business elsewhere. R. Troy, who was a great follower of Charles Ford, explained what had happened. Teleportation, said the lad. The water has been teleported away by those in sore need of it, possibly inhabitants of a nearby sphere, most likely the moon. The pressmen, although ever anxious to accept any solution, as long as it was logical, newsworthy or simply sensational, seemed strangely diffident towards his claims for the existence of telekinetic lunar beams. It was certainly a most extraordinary event, however, and one which would no doubt catapult Brentford once more into the national headlines and at least bring good trade to the flying swan. Neville was going great guns behind the bar. The cash register rang musically and the North Sale sign bobbed up and down like a demented jack-in-the-box. And don't forget, said the part-time barman above the din, Thursday night is cowboy night. Jammed into an obscure corner and huddled over his pint, Jim Pooley watched with loathing the fat backside of an alien pressman which filled his favourite bar stool. O'Malley edged through the crush with two pints of large. It was only after I got home that I remembered where I'd seen those crests before, he explained as he wedged himself in beside Pooley. They were in the coat of arms of the Grand Junction Waterworks. Those doors must have been part of the floodgate system from old Brentford Dock. Pooley sucked upon his pint, his face a sullen mask of displeasure. Then what of old soap? A devilish smile crossed O'Malley's face. Gone, washed away. His fingers made the appropriate motions. So much for old Rich and Jippo and the borrowers beneath, eh? Pooley hunched closer to his pint. A pox on it all, said he. The swan packed full of these idiots, old soap washed away down the proverbial S bend and cowboy night looming up before us with about as much promise as the coming of Ragnarok. O'Malley grinned anew. There are many pennies to be made from an event such as this. I myself have organised several chores of the vicinity for this afternoon at a pound a troll. Pooley shook his head in wonder. You don't waste a lot of time, do you? Mustn't let the grass go under the old size nines. Tell me, John, said Jim. How is it now that man such as yourself, who possesses such an amazing gift for the making of the well-known fast buck, has not set himself up in business long ago and since retired upon the proceeds? I fear, said John, that it's the regularity of the work which depresses me, the daily routine which saps the vital fluids and destroys a man's brain. I prefer greatly to live upon wits I have, and should they ever desert me then, maybe then, I shall take to the work as a full-time occupation. O'Malley took from his pocket a book here for the canal tours sign and began a roll-up, roll-up routine. Pooley rose from the table and excused himself. He had no wish to become involved in O'Malley's venture. He wished only to forget all about subterranean caverns and vanishing canal water. His only thoughts on that matter were as to what might happen should they attempt to refill the stretch of canal. Was Sprite Street lower geographically than the canal? If it was, would the attempt flood the entire neighbourhood? It didn't really bear thinking about. Pooley slouched over to the bar and ordered another pint. Looking forward to Thursday night, I'll bet, Jim, said Neville. Pooley did not answer. Silently he sipped at his ale and let the snippets of barside conversation wash disjointedly about him. And my old granddad is sitting by the dartboard when he threw, came a voice, and the dart went straight through the lobe of his right ear. Pooley sipped at his ale. And as I went to pull it out, the voice continued, the old man said, Now don't, it's completely cured the rheumatism in my left knee. Pooley yawned. Along the bar from him, huddled in their usual conspiratorial poses, were Brentford's two resident jobbing builders, Hairy Dave and Jungle John, so named for their remarkably profuse outcroppings of cerebral hair. The twin brothers were discussing what seemed to be a most complex set of plans, which they had laid out before them on the bar top. I don't think I can quite understand all this, said Dave. It's a pose of certain. 
his brother replied. I don't see why he wants the altar to be so large. I can't see why there aren't to be any pews. Nor an organ. Seems a funny kind of chapel to me. Pooley listened with interest. Surely no one in the neighbourhood could be insane enough to commission those two notorious cowboys to build a chapel. Harry Dave said, I can't see why the plan should be written in Latin. Oh, said his brother, it's Latin, is it? I thought it was trigonometry. Pooley could contain his curiosity no longer, and turned to two master builders. Hello, lads, as business? he asked. John snatched the plan from the bar top and crumpled it into his jacket. Ah, uh, oh, said his brother. Good day, Jim, and uh, how is yourself? For truth, Pooley replied, I am not a well man. Recently I have been privy to events which have seriously damaged my health, but let's not talk of me. How is business? I hear that you are on the up and up on a large contract, I heard. The two brothers stared at each other, and then at Pooley. Not us, said one. I haven't had a bite in weeks, said the other. My, my, said Jim. My informant was certain you had a big one up your sleeve. Something of an ecclesiastical nature, I think. John clutched the plan to his bosom. I haven't had a bite in weeks, his brother reiterated. Been very quiet of late. Harry Dave shook his head, showering Pooley with dandruff. Jungle John did the same. Neville stormed up the bar. Listen, that you too, said the part-time barman. I've warned you before about contaminating my cheese rolls. Sorry, Neville, said the brothers in unison, and rising from their seats they left the bar, leaving their drinks untouched. Most strange, said Pooley. Most astonishing. Those two have seemed very thick together lately, said Neville. It seems that almost every one in this damn pub is plotting something. Tell me, Neville, said Jim, did you ever see any more of our mystery tramp? Thankfully, no, said the part-time barman. And with this canal business taking up everybody's attention, let's hope that no more will ever be said about him. Pooley shook his head. I wouldn't be too certain of that, he said doubtfully. Captain Carson stood upon the canal bridge, staring down into the mud and idly casting his eyes along the bank to where an official-looking Mr O'Malley, dressed in a crested cap and jaunty blazer, led a group of Swedish students along the rutted track towards the woodyard. The captain's loathing for tourists almost overshadowed that which he felt for the figure standing calmly at his side, hands in pockets and smoking seaman shag in one of the captain's favourite pipes. The figure was no longer distinguishable as the wretched and ill-clad monstrosity which had cast an evil shadow across his porch but two short weeks ago. Cleanly shaven and smelling of brill cream, the figure was dressed in a blue roll-neck sweater and a pair of the captain's best corky trousers, a yachting cap and a pair of sailing shoes. The tramp had become a kind of witch's familiar to the captain, haunting his dreams and filling his waking hours with dread. Somehow, and the captain was at a loss to explain how, the tramp had now permanently installed himself at the mission. During meals, he sat in the captain's chair while the captain was obliged to eat in the kitchen. No matter which way the captain turned, the tramp was always there, reclining upon the porch, smoking his cigarettes, lounging in the cosiest fireside chair, sipping rum. He had tricked the captain, again by means the captain was at a loss to understand, out of his chair, his tobacco, his food, drink and finally out of his bed. The tramp sucked deeply upon the captain's briar and blew out a stream of multicoloured smoke. There would seem to be unusual forces at work in this neighbourhood, he observed. The captain surveyed his unwelcome guest with ill-concealed hatred. There are wood indeed, he replied. Somehow, deep down in the lowest depths of his loathing for the tramp, a strange and grudging respect was beginning to stir. The captain could, again, not fully account for these feelings, but now, clean-shaven and well-dressed as he was, the tramp seemed to exude a definite air of authority, possibly of nobility. It was inexplicable. The aura of evil which surrounded him was almost palpable, and the captain seemed to sense his approach at all times, a kind of darkness travelled with the red-eyed man, a fumereal coldness. The captain shuddered. Cold, said the tramp. We best be going back then. Don't want you coming down with any summer cold snow, do we? The captain followed the tramp back towards the mission with dog like obedience. As the tramp strode on the head of him, the captain watched the broad shoulder swing to and fro in a perfect rhythm. Surely the tramp had grown. Surely his bearing was prouder, finer than before. No wonder all the food he ate, thought the captain. But who was he? 
His age was indeterminate. He could be anything between twenty and fifty. There was a vagueness about his features which eluded definition. The captain had gone to great lengths to draw some information from him regarding his name, family and background, but the tramp was infuriatingly evasive. He had made only one statement upon these matters, and this was, There are five here that know my name, and when they speak it, all shall know. As to who these five were, the captain was unable to guess. Possibly the tramp alluded to five of the fictional names he had quoted from the mission's yearly reports. The tramp turned into the mission, which he opened with his own key. The captain followed meekly. The tramp was wearing down his resistance to a point that he no longer questioned any of his actions. "'I wish to speak to you upon a delicate matter,' said the tramp suddenly. "'It's a matter which affects both our futures and one which I know lies heavily upon your soul.' The captain raised a bristling eyebrow. "'Possibly you will wish to open the reserve bottle of rum you keep in the locked cupboard beneath the stairs in order to fortify yourself for what I'm about to say.' The captain humbly obeyed. The two seated themselves upon either side of the captain's table, and two large tots of rum were poured. "'It has come to my notice,' said the tramp, "'that there is one not far from here who would do us harm.' The captain's face showed no expression, but his mind paid silent homage to anyone who would wish ill upon his guest. "'One Brian Crowley,' said the tramp. The captain started up in astonishment. "'It has come to my notice,' the tramp continued, "'that this man harbours the desire to close down this mission, and to dismiss you, my honourable host, without thanks or pension. You who have done so much for the poor and needy, you who have dedicated your life to the unfortunate. The captain shifted uneasily in his seat. There is, I understand, a conspiracy between this Crowley, again he spoke the hated name, and a certain Councillor Wormwood to demolish this mission in order to extend the Butts car park. The captain bit upon his lip. So that was their intention, was it? How the tramp could have come into this intelligence was, of course, beyond any conjecture. But the captain hung upon his every word. We have given the matter much thought, he told the tramp. Night after night I have lain cursing the very name of Crowley and racking my brain for a solution, but none have I found. I think the one might be relatively close at hand, said the tramp. In fact, I feel its warm breath upon my neck even now. The captain poured two more large tots of rum. We shall invite these two individuals to dinner, said the tramp. The captain bent double in a fit of frenzied coughing. Calm yourself, said the tramp. I fear, said the captain, that the breath you feel upon your neck is one of severe halitosis. The tramp's face was without expression. He drank down his tot of rum and watched the captain, his eyes unblinking, two drops of blood upon colourless orbs. Thursday night would be ideal, said the tramp. But what if they won't come? After all, Crowley hates me and Wormer will never want to expose himself in any way. They will come, said the tramp, and I think I can promise you a most entertaining evening. His ghastly eyes glittered with a fierce luminosity, and the captain tossed back his rum with a quivering hand. Brian Crowley held up the gilt-edged invitation card to the sunlight. It presented a most extraordinary appearance, almost transparent and clearly wrought of the finest vellum. Never for one moment would he have attributed such style, taste or elegance to the old sea captain. The edging of the card had more the look of being worked in gold leaf than sprayed in the gilded paint of the printer's shop. The typeface was of a design that Brian did not recognise, its finely drawn serifs and cunning arabesques seeming of almost Islamic origin. And the smell of it! Something stirred within him, some recollection from his past. It was a smell of incense, church incense. He had smelt it many times before, as a choir boy at St Mary's. That was it, church incense. While Brian's romantic imagination ran in luminous spirals about the card, the callous side to his nature gloated, for the card which had flopped through his burnished letterbox to land with the many plain brown wrappers upon the purple shag pile bore an inscription which made his heart leap for joy. 
You are formally invited to a reception and banquet on Thursday the 15th of June at the Siemens Mission, Brentford, in celebration of that honourable establishment's centenary year and also to honour Captain Horatio B. Carson upon the announcement of his retirement. Black Tie RSVP, 7.30pm for 8pm, admission by this card only. Brian sighed deeply and pressed the scented card to his lips. Things could not have been better. The captain to announce his retirement. He had not realised it was the mission centenary year, but it was clear that for the sake of appearance he must attend. The rest of the committee would be there and his absence would not go unnoticed. He would RSVP this very morning. At last, the wheels of fortune were beginning to turn to his advantage. He could almost smell the delicious odours of Mario's cooking.